What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. This is part of the Top VC series and Top Israel uh, Business Leader series. Past episodes include one with Moïse Navone of Mobileye, when he talks about the Mobileye journey of being acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. Yuri Adoni is the author of Unstoppable Startup. You could check that out. And Jonathan Medved, founder of CEO of Our Crowd, uh, the world's largest equity crowdfunding platform, and uh, Ellie, today's guest, I was watching you speak in a panel on, on our crowd conference. And Yossi Vardy has some amazing stories. So check that episode out, including his biggest wins and even his biggest misses as an investor. And uh, before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, and at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. Uh, we help you run your podcast. Uh, the number one thing, Ellie, in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And a podcast over the past, since 2008, has allowed me to profile some of the people I really admire and um, who have become friends. And I've been able to refer people to them and, and vice versa. And so if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. Actually, Ellie, you know, sometimes I talk about it, sometimes not. It was actually inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were concentration cam- in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And there's an interview that the Holocaust Foundation did with my grandfather that is on my about page. And I feel like it's helping people leave a legacy, you know, as well. So uh, check that out if you have a chance. Um, I am excited to introduce today's guest and big thank you to Craig Weiss who introduced me. Um, Craig Weiss uh, runs retainerclub.com and their podcast is in your face. So check it out. Um, Ellie Wertman is co-founder and partner at Pico Venture Partners, uh, which is an early stage venture uh, capital firm headquartered in Jerusalem. His investments include Vroom, uh, which hit a market cap of $5.5 billion after its IPO. Um, Spot.io, which got acquired by NetApp for $450 million. Gloat, Charge After, Auto Lead Star. We actually had founder um, Aron Horowitz, um, and he's been on the podcast. He's amazing. And Auto Lead Star, check it out. Um, and prior to Pico, Ellie was a general partner of Benchmark Capital, worked with Dr- Jerusalem Venture Partners. He launched his first company in 1993. I don't even know what the internet looked like. Then there was, there was really no internet. I don't know what it was. He took three companies from founding to IPO. He was co-founder and CEO of Delta Three, Jerusalem's first unicorn, which we'll talk about. His other notable startups include Iron Source, where he was an external director and active mentor. Uh, he was co-founder and lead investor in Vroom, which I mentioned. And he's founder of Pico Kids, a social enterprise focused on child education in Jerusalem. And he also found, if he wasn't busy enough, uh, Bat Shlomo Vineyards, a boutique winery in Northern Israel. Ellie, thanks for joining me. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. I think I'm going to have to make it uh, shorter. It's so, well-deserved. Uh, I mean, a lot of group. Okay. It's well-deserved. You know, and I wanted to start off with, um, how did you meet Craig Weiss? Craig Weiss uh, lived in Jerusalem briefly. And I, uh, he had just written a book with his brother about the... Um, founding generation of, of Israel during the War of Independence, the American and Israeli, the American volunteers who came to Israel. And I heard him pitch his book. It was a speaking tour. And I was very moved by uh, what he had written and what he had said and his passion for Israel. And I'm very passionate about Israel. And, uh, you know, I said, I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, to follow up. And uh, lo and behold, I invited him for a Shabbat dinner, as many people tend to do here. And it's a long time, I don't want to say, but more than 20 years later, we're still very good friends and, and business partners on many occasions. So talk about your discussions on Enjoy. I was, you know, Craig lived here. He moved back to the U.S. And he called me up. He said, Ellie, I have this family business. My brother started. Would it be OK if I called you every once in a while just to get some advice? Well, every once in a while, not only did it become every week, it became every day, and definitely every uh, waking hour when our time zones overlapped. Um, and you know, at the point, 
you know, Craig had a big vision and, and, and I share people's big visions. It's what I do. I work with entrepreneurs on, on helping them realize big ideas. Um, he wanted to uh, obsolete cigarettes, right? That was a very big idea. And I took an interest in it and in joining him as, as chairman of the company and, and to actively help them build a company. Um, and, you know, that's something that just happened over time, literally over the phone between Jerusalem and uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. With time, I also convinced him that he would be the best CEO for the company, but that's a whole different story. We definitely got into that a little bit as well. Um, you know, back to, so you're eight and you moved to Israel. Why? That's correct. So I, I grew up in a, uh, in a family that was, um, you know, very ideological. They, they, they saw an historic moment in the, in the rebirth of Israel, right? Uh, you yourself mentioned that, uh, that your ancestors were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, and this moment of, of the creation of the state of Israel called many people to, to come here to be part of the building and founding of this country. Um, I was just a child, I was brought along, but definitely my entire adult life, even if I complained as a kid, why were my parents taking me away, um, has been very much as a builder you know, of this country. And, and I, I've expressed that in, in being a, a economic builder, big entrepreneur and job creation, but it's really a special part of living in Israel is, this, is the ideological framework in which we live. Um, you know, I, I believe very similar to the way many people live in the U.S. as well, right? Which is, um, it's a young country. It was founded by visionaries with an ideological uh, bend towards building something different that stood for something. And um, it's very much how I live my life here. It's very much how I see a continuity in my identity as somebody who was born in the U.S. but, but grew up here and very much feel at home in, in both countries. What did you learn from your mom? What did you see your mom doing? Because she was uh, an activist. I tell people, you know, I, I don't have an MBA. I don't have a degree in economics. I don't have a degree in technology. Um, you know, I tell people that the best training, if you want to be an entrepreneur, is to be an activist. And probably the next best, best thing is to be the child of an activist. To see somebody who is out to accomplish something very big, in her case, it was bringing down the, the Soviet empire uh, to, uh, for human rights, to give people the right to immigrate, to give Jews the right to practice their religion, to return to their homeland. Uh, and doing that with, with minimal resources, um, making a lot of noise you know, in the public sphere, applying political pressure, we're gonna call it different forms of marketing, and the product happened to have been human rights and freedom of immigration. Good product. Um, it's a great, it's a great product, right? Mm -hmm. And learning how people organize, how they work together, how they do things across borders, um, you know, really, as I look back at my career, is what I've done, right? I've worked with a, in many cases, a small band of entrepreneurs wanting to change the reality in an industry, right? And, and organizing with small means compared to the big corporates that we usually take on uh, as startups. And you'll see the parallels, right? It, it makes total sense, right? But it, it took me a long time to realize it, but definitely uh, growing up um, with activist uh, parents, my mom and my dad are very much a framework for, for what I uh, have done throughout my career. Yeah. And Ali, tell me about um, what's a story that you remember, uh, maybe at the time you didn't realize it impacted you, but looking back uh, from your your mom doing her, her thing as an activist. Yeah. So, you know, I, I spend a lot of time as, as a business executive thinking about the need to document things, to communicate clearly, to share, you know, with other people. And I can remember as a child, um, late at night, because of the time zone differences, uh, my mom and my dad being on the phone with cassette recorders, right? You, you, you're sitting in front of a microphone right now, we're using uh, some you know, hard disk space in the cloud, but back in the day, it was, it, was a, it was a microphone collected to a tape recorder, 
with a suction device attached to the back of a handheld telephone recording phone calls, right? Of my mother calling into Moscow, Leningrad, Leningrad, other pieces across the Soviet Union, speaking to activists on the ground there, uh, speaking to people who were organizing, um, documenting those phone calls, writing them up, getting the word out there. And as you know, once again, it's a reflective moment, and I and I, and I thank you for for helping me to remember that. You know, when we come up with ideas today, and we're trying to do small things or big things, you know, here in Jerusalem or wherever you might be as an entrepreneur, and communicating with the world and sharing the messages, not just what happened. Um, or not just what you're working on, but why you're working on it, what you're doing, right? The underlying mission. And the same things that I probably learned or, or saw as a child um, are things that I apply to my, uh, to my business and my entrepreneurial endeavors as I, as I go forward. Yeah, Ellie, as your mom and dad took on uh, a country uh, as their activism, you tend to take on technology, disrupt technology, you know, disrupt major industries with technology. Um, and you started, co-founded Delta 3. So, um, and took on the telephone industry. Um, what did you see at the time? What was the original idea? Well, communications are very basic human need. We, we, we like to connect with, with people. Um, you know, I, I think, I think it was AT&T, right? The old advertisement, reach out and touch someone, right? This idea of connecting people. There was one problem. It was very, very expensive. It, it cost several dollars a minute to make an international phone call. Uh, I was a, I was a student in, in the United States and I would actually schedule with my parents 10 minutes a week. It was like a holy 10 minutes. And it was, you know, why do we only speak for 10 minutes? And on a Sunday morning, it was the discounted rate. And it only cost us $20 for that phone call, right? It was $2 a minute. Um, and, you know, as you said, 1993, don't even remember the internet. One of the early startups in, in the, in, when the internet was starting was an Israeli company called Vocal, Vocal Check. Uh, and they are one of the true pioneers. It was back when... Uh, Netscape was the main browser. It wasn't even version one, it was version 0 0.97. And this young Israeli company had figured out how to, to translate your voice signal into a digital signal and, and put, it over, um, put it over IP networks, which were just developing around the world with the advent of the internet. I tried this. I called my partner in New York and I said, this is this incredible new technology, let's try it. But the next thing we said to each other was, what if you could pick up a regular telephone, make that international phone call at a fraction of the cost of what AT&T or MCI or Sprint would be charging at the time? Um, and that's what we set out to do. And we did it from Jerusalem. And we, in a very short period of time, in three years, had, had built a global network connecting the public switch telephone network to the international IP networks with this technology that, that converted uh, voice to an IP signal uh, and built a company, um, global company, operating uh, throughout the world, and literally being at the forefront of you know, lowering the cost of international calling. And that is you know, you know, the, my answer to the question when everyone said, well, what, what are you gonna do when AT&T takes you on? I said, you know, with technology and speed and uh, creativity, we will you know, forge a new way. And that's what we did. When you're paving uh, a new way and um, you know, you're, you're kind of creating this path that no one's been on before, what were the, some of the biggest challenges during that time? You know, the internet <laughs> didn't work uh, the way it does today. Um, and things don't always go as planned. Uh, um, you know, and, you know, you've set up a server in Moscow, or better yet, I flew to Moscow to figure out, you know, where I can lease IP lines from. And the only IP network in town is, is the old KGB network. And my meeting is with a general in bottle of vodka and not, you know, a business executive at the phone company. But literally those were, you know, those were some of the uh, types of experiences we had. Um, I sent one of my guys to uh, Colombia, the country, 
I said, don't come back until we have a, we have an IP network that we can connect to. And he calls me, he's in the middle of the jungle and there's these, these like it's, he's not sure when he's on the back of this Jeep, if he's going into some drug dealer's den or a communications company. Um, but sure enough, when he gets there, there's these huge um, satellite, you know, uh, receiving stations that are transmitting uh, over MCI's network uh, IP lines. Uh, the challenge is when you're doing something new is finding partners, it's building relationships, it's taking, you know, this leap of faith that it's all going to work out, right? I was young and naive, of course, but sending an executive to, uh, what's an executive? We were all 20 something, right? Our, our, our training wasn't very uh, significant in terms of world experience. Figuring out with a sense of mission and purpose that we're going to do something and doing whatever it takes to get it done is the ethos you know, of, a, of an entrepreneur. And I would say specifically an Israeli entrepreneur, anything is possible. All you have to do is go out and, you know, do it. Um, or as Nike used to say, or probably still say, just do it, right? And that is, that is the mantra uh, for me. It's the mantra for many Israeli entrepreneurs. Um, and basically facing things that seem, you know, insurmountable or out of a movie um, eventually become possible when you are on the path of, of trying to achieve your goals. Yeah, the training was not in uh, navigating the jungle, I guess you can say. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's so interesting, Ali, because so you going to Moscow, um, you know, are you speaking a language? How does that meeting go down? I mean, I figure I picture you in sunglasses, a, a trench coat and a briefcase, you know, like, it just seems like uh, an interesting, it'll go, uh, interesting business meeting, I guess you could say. So for starters, there was a trench coat, right? I got, I live in Israel. It's a pretty warm climate here. I get to Moscow and I was freezing. And, you know, we went out and I bought a trench coat to keep warm. Um, that meeting and... You know, I really have not thought about this story in many, many years. You know, I literally show up 11 o'clock in the morning. There are these, there's this guy, he's a former, former you know, general equivalent in KGB or the, the Soviet army or whatever it was at the time. I mean, I would be there's, scared there's a going into this. Vodka on it. I would be, I would be worried. Yeah. It's good to be young, right? Because we're naive and we're not scared as easily as we are today. Um, you know, when you're young, you're, you're somewhat invincible. Um, in hindsight, I should have been very scared and very nervous. The vodka gets opened up. The glasses are poured. It's explained to me that we're going to drink vodka while we have this discussion and negotiation on pricing on the, on the old KDB network. And, you know, it won't surprise you when I tell you that some of the details are a little hazy. But I do remember having to excuse myself, take a short nap, and then coming back to complete the process. It is wild. I, <laughs> I, I, I am I'm a lightweight when it comes to drinking, so that that would they would definitely have an advantage on me. Um, so you know, then what happened? Um, kind of at the end, uh, towards the end of Delta Three, you took it public. Yeah. So yeah. So we. So I, Going public is, is, is not the end. It's, it's sometimes the end for venture capitalists. It's, it's the beginning for many companies, right? Um, but it was an amazing run kind of from three, just over th three years, May 96 to November 99, we, we started a company that we couldn't convince anybody to invest in. They're like, you know, what are you doing? Um, I think I had offered some guy like, 10% of the company for $10,000. He turned me down. The punchline is that company at its peak value was worth $2 billion, right? So that was a $200 million position. Um, <laughs> he might be listening to your show. He, he's a, I'm not going to say his name, but he's originally from Chicago. And, um, and he remembers that story. Um, we literally, the first round, we raised $117,000. From individuals who weren't sure if they were making a donation to Israel or investing in a company, it was mostly from Americans, uh, people in New York. Um, and you know, we went public November '99, 
We start the morning at a $500 million market cap. We end the day at a billion dollar market cap. So it was a double, very similar to the Vroom story, which we'll talk about later. Um, it stays above a billion for over a year. And then as many people remember, the markets crashed, right? The dot-com bubble burst, the telecommunications bubble burst, 9-11, second T5 in Israel. You know, we went from the best of times to the worst of time. The company survived. I met somebody a couple of years ago. He says, Ellie, you don't remember me. Uh, you hired me 18 years ago as a junior network operations center, um, you know, hourly worker or shift worker, something like that, is I just left the company, you know, 18 years later. Wow. Uh, so companies have a long life, a long life beyond the original kind of entrepreneurial founders period. Many founders stay with their companies, you know, throughout. I'm more of a serial entrepreneur. I've started companies and, and we'll go on to the next thing and the next thing. I guess it's my version of, 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 of having issues uh, concentrating. But um, of course, I've gone on to be an investor as well. But, um, you know, Delta Three, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't kind of stay up there from a valuation perspective, but it, it had a very long life and uh, provided jobs and income for many people for a very long time, something I'm very proud of, of course. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, that the person was there 18 years later. Um, so you mentioned Vroom and we talked about, you know, um, disrupting major industries with technology, the telephone, now the auto industry. So what happened with Vroom? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not I'm not a car guy. I uh, until recently, you know, I was driving a 10, a 10 year old, um, uh, 10 year old car and it's filled with scratches. And yet somebody calls me up in the summer of 2014 and says, Ellie, I invest in this dealership in, in Grand Prairie, Texas. I'm like, I don't think I've ever been to Texas, let alone Grand Prairie, wherever that is. He says, look, I know you're in between things. Can you just, can you fly over there? Check it out. They need somebody with your venture mindset. And, you know, I'm like, if I'm coming to the U.S., you know, I will come see you. And sure enough, I was. And I called a very close friend of mine, uh, Alon Bloch, who, who uh, he and I have worked with off and on since 2003. I said, Alon, you know, would you come with me and take a look at this thing? And it was my first time in a dealership uh, in the U.S. And maybe ever, as I think about it, maybe once. And I could not believe that this is how people buy and buy cars, right? We we I was one of, I was one of the, you know as a consumer I was as a, I was an early adopter on Amazon. I think my account goes back to 1998, um, and you know I do most of my consumption <clears throat> online, um, and this idea that there's a salesperson that I have to speak to, and it's you know somewhat unpleasant, untrustworthy. It just made absolutely no sense to me. At the same time, it's probably pretty naive, like in my head as an entrepreneur, I'm like, oh, we can build a website. We can have the inventory on there real line. We can have fair pricing and we'll ship it anywhere in the United States. And if you're not happy, we'll take it back in seven days, which, you know, to me made total sense. Everyone's like, you know, people need to do a test drive. They need to kick the tires. And very quickly, I came to the conclusion that that was all um, make believe. It was make believe for an era when um, you know sales were were one to one, where a um, uh, you wanted to get the consumer into a car for that test drive to do a high pressure sale. But the modern consumer is very well educated, researches everything online. They actually know what they want to buy before they buy it, and why not uh, offer fair pricing based on the algorithms online, why not deliver delight to the, uh, to the end customer? And I you know we're all, all entrepreneurs are inspired by other entrepreneurs. And, and you may have read, uh, you know, the book uh, by Tony Shea about Zappos or you know, delivering happiness. And why could we not do the same thing with cars? Why could we not take the single worst consumer experience, you know, shopping experience in the United States 
you know, uh, buying a, a car, let alone buying a used car, which is probably even worse. Uh, my friends joke with me for a very long time that I was a used car salesman. Um, and, you know, turning it into an into a honest, fair, delightful, trustworthy experience. And that's what we set out to do when we, when we founded Vroom, uh, when we took this dealership, which, which, which was called Auto America, and transformed it into Vroom and renamed it and built it into a technology company. So where does that stand today? Because it actually um, also had a, an exit. Yeah. So, you know, when I set out to do this with, with a loan, you know, we both said to ourselves, this might be our biggest accomplishment yet. And this was at the beginning. And we kind of just felt that the size of the opportunity and the fragmentation of the market and the broken, um, the broken business process around this industry uh, lent itself to a very large outcome. And, you know, Vroom went public in June um, of this year, not so long ago, in the middle of the beginning of the COVID storm, before we, we knew how bad it really was. It seemed like the world was coming to an end. And yet that storm ended up being the perfect storm for Vroom, right? You don't have to go into a showroom. You don't have to speak to anybody. The car gets delivered to your front door. All those millennials who said they were never going to drive all of a sudden don't want to take public transportation. They want to own cars, right? So everything was lined up for the Vroom business model actually accelerated by what was going on outside. So a public offering in, uh, in June acted like the perfect timing. As I said to you, we went out, I think that morning at a $2.2 billion market cap. And by the close of the day, we were we were at five billion, and that was the number which which my partner and I said maybe this is the one. We had done some amazing things. We had we had we had built unicorns before. Maybe this would be the first one to be, to become a very uh, large company, and uh, it happened much quicker than we believed it would. It was it was a very exciting day, as you can imagine. Really exciting day. And, you know, the thing is, I'm curious. So you went through the dot-com bubble. You went through the 2008 financial crisis and now Corona. Do you see, um, did those, going through those eras prepare you for this at all? Absolutely. So in March, uh, March 5th, um, I came back to Israel from a, a ski trip. And kind of word of Corona was becoming more, more um, robust, right, and more publicized. And the the crisis had started to really get out of control in Europe. And we remember the horror stories from Italy and other places. And um, it became clear to me that it was time to go in the bunker, right? And it hadn't yet kind of hit the mainstream. But, you know, not only was a crisis coming, it was going to be of epic proportions. And I spent, you know, the next days and weeks on, on daily calls, morning to night, with CEOs and founders in our portfolio at, at Pico. We'd never been through a crisis before. They didn't know what a crisis means. And, you know, many of these companies were, were, were out in the cliff facing sudden death. If you hadn't raised capital recently, you know, the idea that, that it would be possible to raise capital seemed impossible. Now things have worked out a little bit differently than we predicted, but preparing for the crisis, being ready for the crisis um, was something which, which to me had become second nature. And here in Israel, unfortunately, we've been through, you know, even more crises with um, with various, you know, flare-ups uh, that we've experienced here with terrorism and other things. Thank God it's been very quiet for very long. But um, crisis is second nature. And managing through crisis towards positive outcomes has really become a specialty of mine. Um, the story, as you know, is that most digital companies have accelerated, right, and have grown by leaps and bounds. And that, if anything, um, um, the corona crisis has been an accelerator of digital transformation, digital business. 
but preparing for crisis and getting uh, companies' balance sheets in order and getting people you know ready that they have to do the right thing when when crisis is upon us. Right, that it's it's not about firing people; it's about everyone tightening their belts so that we can get through this to the other end together and intact. Those are the talks I had daily with entrepreneurs um, as we kind of made our way through March and April. By May, we were experiencing rapid growth. It was almost kind of like I got to pinch myself that you know that this is actually uh, the perfect storm, as I said before, for digital transformation. Ali, I want to talk about your advice in a crisis. Um, you know, any of the companies you remember talking to and what you said to, to one of them, but I do remember you saying something about, a, I don't remember which past company, but, um, you said a rocket was shot at Israel. You were seeing if it was going to be actually, um, you know, uh, you know, thwarted and then you went back to the business deal. So this stuff is happens even despite, doesn't have to be the dot com bubble. Doesn't have to be the two thousand eight financial crisis. But this stuff has happened throughout. Um, what was your advice to to one of the people? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean it's it, it, it's fundamentally. I think it's pretty basic. You know, human advice. Uh, wearing is not going to get us anywhere. It's 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 staying positive. It's understanding that relationships are long and forever. You know, and doing the right thing. Right, and it's. For me, the core values, right, of, of how you handle things in this moment uh, is different. I mean, the, the, the rocket is different from, from COVID, where I was really worried about companies going uh, bankrupt. And you might say that a rocket hitting your office could be pretty, uh, pretty fatal as well, right? But the attitude is the same, right? It, it's moving forward. It's looking past. Uh, there's a poem, which I love, called The Trough. Um, which is just a reminder that kind of um, we will see the horizon again. It's basically a positive, positive outlook on life and on the world. Um, and sometimes our job, just mentoring entrepreneurs or, or leaders, is, is, is reminding them that we're going to get back on top. We always do, right? Humanity has always kind of gotten through these things and, and, and moved forward, no matter how bleak they may seem. And, and Having the strength uh, to do that um, is important. And sometimes we need people to hold our hand to get there. Totally. Um, we talked about the, you know, transforming, uh, you know, the auto industry and talk about Auto Lead Star. And uh, how did you meet Aaron Horowitz? Yeah, so Aaron is, is really one of my uh, favorite people. And um, he's going to have to listen to hear that, I'm not going to tell him, and you're not going to tell him I said that. Um, he is an amazing entrepreneur. He, he was a social activist, going back to our earlier conversation, before he was a, uh, a business entrepreneur. He built one of the greatest social enterprises here in Jerusalem and in Israel, and I think today it's international, called Present Tense. And he is exactly the kind of person I like to invest in. We had met... Um, here in Jerusalem and in, in the entrepreneurial community. And I was immediately um, interested in, in who he was as a person, the values that drove him, that obviously succeeding in business uh, had important you know, financial uh, KPIs attached to it, but he was interested as I am in, in building the economy of our city and building the economy of our country and ultimately using technology to, to transform business. And, you know, I, I knew a lot about the auto industry because of Broom and, and, and he was working on uh, various AI technologies to enhance um, uh, consumer behavior around, uh, around customer acquisition and all sorts of things online. And we got into a mentorship relationship. I was not an investor in this company initially, uh, but I really liked him as a person. And we spend a lot of time together. And some people you give advice to and they kind of nod their head and they move on. And at one point I, I had suggested something to, to our own and, you know, he went out and, and did it and came back a few weeks later and said, what do you think? And, you know, I realized that, you know, there could be a tremendous opportunity to work with somebody like our own who 
was interested not only in what I had to say, was willing to act on it, but it was also ideologically driven the same way I was. And, and we've become very good friends over the years. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of being his, his uh, lead investor in his business and helping him grow it and create you know jobs here. And it's, it's everything, it's the whole package um, that I've enjoyed. Um, and I'm sure we're going to build a very successful company. Definitely. Um, I talk about Pico and since starting Pico. So Pico stands for people, ideas, community, and opportunity. Uh, four words, which I ho hold very dearly. And I believe that when you bring those words together, uh, great, great things happen. And um, early days of Pico, somebody, an Italian journalist had come by and, and asked me about the name. He said to me, uh, Pico, an Italian, Piccolino, something very small, it doesn't make sense. And I, uh, luckily, I just ignored him. <laughs> and then a Spanish journalist came in and told me that uh, Pico in Spanish means the peak, right? The peak of a mountain. And that works very well with my beliefs, right? And this idea that we bring together people, idea, community, and opportunity, that together we can, we can reach the peak. And Pico started really as a social enterprise. I was a fellow at the, I still am a fellow at the, in the Aspen Institute at the, in the Middle East Leadership Initiative. Um, on this journey uh, from what they call success to significance. And that we have to take our entrepreneurial skills and try and fundamentally create a better world, a better reality around us. And Pico started as a social enterprise project for myself in Jerusalem, wanting to bring together the entrepreneurial community through a sense of space. I built out this beautiful loft here in an industrial area in Jerusalem that brought people together basically an open platform policy. If you're a for-profit entrepreneur, you'd welcome to kind of sit there and pay what you could. And if you were a social entrepreneur, just come sit for free and be a part of the community. And um, we, um, we very quickly discovered that the energy of bringing together social entrepreneurs and um, for-profit entrepreneurs create a, a very unique uh, energy, which drove people to go further. Um, Pico started there. I very quickly found myself exposed to amazing people like Aaron Horowitz, like um, other entrepreneurs who we ended up backing. Uh, you might be, we, I, I'm not an investor, but you might be familiar with a company called Via. We provide a lot of public transportation, ship pool transportation. Um, in New York and other cities that started at Pico. So there's these great people, great opportunities, lots of uh, creativity, great sense of community. And I realized I was going to be investing uh, in startups and, and Pico, the place also became Pico Venture Partners, the fund. Um, and it was born you know, from a social mission The entrepreneurs change the world. And, and I wanted to enable that. And, Capital is a, is a necessary requirement, right, to build businesses. So the two went very well together. You know, first of all, Ellie, thank you. Um, one last quick question, um, but I want to point people towards Pico.Partners. I don't know if there's any other places we should point people towards online to find out more. Yeah, so, you know, Pico.Partners uh, talks about our values, talks about our portfolio. It's a good place to learn more about us. Um, I, I would say I'm, I, I used to be really shy, but recently I've done a few more interviews and I'm, I'm happy to be uh, hosted by you here, Jeremy. So I really speak a lot about this nexus of, of values and, and being mission driven, driven as an individual and how that I think complements um, success in business and entrepreneurial drive. and. And you know, I, I would encourage your listeners to uh, to kind of tune into that. Very much inspired by the values from my home and my upbringing, um, and uh, other other experiences throughout my life. Um, and um, you know, the other place where, where I talk about things which are important to me is an organization called Pico Kids, which we started, which is really 
focused on on the future generations and mm -hmm. and giving youth 21st century skills, values, um, a sense of identity, and understanding you know our roles in this world, where we come from, uh, you know where we're at, where we're going, and and each individual's uh, ability to contribute to that. So that would be the other area I would I would kind of direct you to. That was my last question, actually, Ellie, is Pico Kids and one of your favorite stories from Pico Kids. So one of my favorite stories, you know, Pico Kids was born in our office with 12 kids and it grew to 4,000 children, is an interaction between nine or 10 uh, young uh, women uh, in seventh grade who were participating in one of our uh, make-a-thons. It's like a hackathon, but you make things. And they had built a prototype um, for a new diver's watch that, that provided feedback, not only on, on your own vital signs, but also on your friend's vital signs, whoever you might be diving with. And, as, and, and it was part of a larger makeathon about ocean living and rising tides. And um, I brought in a high tech executive who was the CEO of a, uh, of a startup called Connect Team, who in his military service in Israel, was actually commander of a submarine. And, um, and part of the way we work is that we have people from the high tech industry interact with kids um, at what we call eye level and treat them like adults and provide real feedback. And his real feedback was, your innovation is going to save lives. Your innovation is going to save the lives of soldiers, of divers, that this is something that we can really take to the Israeli Navy, we can take to civilian industries. And it's that interaction, which I believe empowers a child, or in this case, these young women, to say, I can do it. I have what it takes. My creative abilities um, that every single person, in my belief in the world has, will get me where I need to go, right? But that, that lightning bolt of confidence is what inspires me every day. And seeing uh, many young people in Pico Kids with big smiles on their face, with a sense of confidence that they can go out and conquer the mountain and reach that peak is what you know I believe we're doing at Pico Kids. I know I have to finish up, Jeremy, but it, it reminded me of my last story. It'll be a nice bookend to where you started asking me about Craig Weiss. And I was Craig Weiss's mentor as he was building Enjoy. And at one point, uh, we went to Yosemite together, and I, I call it the best day of, of CEO training. And we were going to climb, uh, I believe it's Yosemite Falls, was the name of the hike. It's a 3,000-foot climb, pretty much straight up if you've done it. Uh, it's a path, but it's pretty, pretty straight up. And I was, you know, I'm still overweight, but I was much more overweight at the time. And, you know, here's Craig, and he's like, you know, we're halfway up and he's like, you know, in his head, this guy, Ellie's not going to make it. Like, you know, I don't, you know, all I need to do is last a little bit longer than him. And uh, then we can go back down and get a nice meal. But, you know, what he saw was my drive and, and to, to really go up and conquer that mountain and reach the peak. And, and nicely, you know, this comes together with Pico in Spanish. Uh, unintended, by the way, but this idea that we're constantly climbing mountains, we're having to, we're, we're wanting to get to the top, and there's always another peak to climb. Um, it's fundamentally what excites me. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a young person in the world, if you're just, um, you know, here and want to have, you know, a sense of fulfillment, it, it's about going out there. It's having to drive to get there. And, and it's, it's what I would leave you with as we, as we kind of summarize Pico, Pico Kids and, and the entrepreneurial journey. Ali, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out Pico.partners and much more. Check out more episodes. Thanks everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.